Um, all right, so Galatians chapter 3. And I am on a salvation by grace alone through faith alone kick because I decided to start reading Romans with the teenagers in the, uh, in the Sunday school when we do Sunday school on Sunday mornings. And so we started talking about how everybody has sinned. And I mean everybody, Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter. Everybody has sinned. Well, we haven't gotten there yet, but chapter one is, man, you ought to be able to look around and see that there is a God and, uh, and, that, uh, and you know right from wrong. Even the Gentiles have a conscience that convicts them of right and wrong, and so they know that they are doing wrong. Therefore, they are without excuse. And the Jews knew better, so they're definitely without excuse. And by, by chapter three, Paul is just summing up his argument, all have sinned. All have sinned. So Romans is a revolutionary book. Uh, it was one of the main things that Martin Luther studied that led to the Reformation. And, uh, and it, it always seems to lead to a Reformation in the church when, uh, when we start reading and studying Romans. In Romans, Paul lays out in a very logical argument, and he was not only highly educated in the Jewish way, but his family were Roman citizens. So he probably knew his way around Greek and logical Socratic thought and argument and rhetoric. How many Greek words do you know? Rhetoric is one. Socratic. Uh, cosmos, there's another Greek word. Oh, phooey. Yeah, that's a load of hooey. I told you it was Hebrew. I was only slightly lying, but uh, I was joking. But uh, but uh, there are you, you actually know a lot of Greek words. Uh, anathema. That's kind of a church word, you know, at an ana anathema. That's anathema. That is a New Testament word for that is forbidden. It's it's. It's worse, it's worse than forbidden. Because if you remember in the Old Testament, you were supposed to stay away from certain things, like the person with the leprosy or whatever, they were under the ban. And uh, as the world went from speaking Hebrew and Aramaic to Greek, they had to latch onto a Greek word that meant the same thing. And so anathema was a, was a you know, that's anathema. It's worse than forbidden. Don't do that. Stay away from that. That's anathema. So anyways, cosmos is a Greek word. All the world, all the universe, all the cosmos. But um, in Galatians, we have angry Paul. Angry Paul, angry that someone came along and preached a different gospel than the one that leads to salvation. And so we open up in chapter 3, verse 1, with, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Now, I think at this point, a little bit of review is uh, good. Paul has argued in chapters 1 and 2 that he is an apostle. And keep in mind, Apostle is a big word. Apostello is the Greek word for to send. I, apostello would mean I send. So an apostle is simply someone who is sent, right? Like when I was talking about uh, Robin Sisk giving me her offering to put in the offering. She sent me to do something for her and I utterly failed for a month until today. So and Jerry was there and and uh, and and he you were there when they handed that to me and I said sure I'll get that in there and I stuck it in the pocket of a jacket I don't normally wear so it's been riding along in there but it's in there today but I was a poor apostle I was not, I was sent to do a job I didn't do it very well now the big question when we talk about apostles is are there apostles of God today the Catholic Church says yes, because the Pope carries on the mantle of apostleship handed down 
by the first Pope, St. Peter. That is what, so they have apostolic authority. And they might even recognize another church if you claim that another apostle started your church. And anyways, some of the more Pentecostal charismatic type groups, they'll have apostolic in the name. Church of the Apostles or Apostolic Holiness Church or something like that because they're saying that we are just as filled with the Holy Spirit as the Apostles. Are we less filled with the Holy Spirit than the Apostles? Are we just as filled with the Holy Spirit as the Apostles? And finally, those of us that don't swing from the rafters, if you'll forgive me, uh, we will often say that today there are no more apostles. We will say that um, Peter, James, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Paul, Paul's a special case. Paul came along later, but God spoke through him in a mighty way. They are apostles. We have no apostles today. That's pretty standard in Baptist churches. However, there is a more nuanced version that, that I subscribe to myself. And I know that the New Testament was not written with capital letters and lowercase letters. Did you know that? They don't even have space between the words. When you try to read it, it's one big mess. But I think of it in terms of capital A apostle. People who write books of the Bible. They receive from God a revelation so powerful and so inerrant. They wrote it down and we have that. Now, we're not going to have any of those capital A apostles today because, you know, you come to me with the new book of the Bible you've written and I'm just going to point to the door, okay? Not in our church. Lots of Mormons around go to their church. Tell them what you've heard from God. But if you write a new book to the Bible, you're out. However, are we sent by God in the strict definition of the Greek word apostle? We better be sent by God. We better be sent by God. We better be sending missionaries. We all better be sent somewhere with a mission from God. So maybe we might call that little a apostles. We are all sent by God. We're not sent by God quite in the same way as Peter, James, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Paul. But we are sent by God, we have a mission, and we go forth in God's power to do his will. So Paul argues that he is, in fact, a capital A apostle. He lives at the same time as Peter, James, and John. And he says, look, I received a revelation of Jesus just as much as them. He tells us the story of how he went and talked with them. And even at one point, they tried to hammer out their theology and when he told them what he had been preaching to the gentiles they all all he got was applause and pats on the back and yes yes the spirit of the lord has led you into all truth and we are all in agreement amen hallelujah and now all of a sudden different teaching has surfaced it's gained a lot of um popularity and that teaching is if you want to follow jesus you must also be circumcised. And of course, this doesn't just apply to Christians in the first century who want to know whether or not they have to be circumcised to follow Jesus. This applies until Jesus comes again for all of the many things that we might try to add on to the salvation of Jesus. Okay? Do you need Okay, we want you to repent and believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, have your sins covered and forgiven, and we also want you to vote Republican. No. Do what? That's an add-on. Add Whether it's a good one or not, it's an add-on. It is not necessary. Now, for many years, uh, the left side has claimed public good and social good. In fact, I learned that in Europe, if you're a pastor and you're not on the left, they think, well, what's wrong with you? Don't you care about poor people? It's kind of almost the opposite of, of over here in the United States. Well, guess what? Uh, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and try to overthrow the government. No, 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 that's an add-on. You know, uh, 
trying to start some sort of Marxist revolution. That is not anything that Jesus requires. That is not, you know, all of these things can be add-ons. You got to believe in Jesus and be a good person. No, you got to believe in Jesus and come to church every Sunday. No, you got to believe in Jesus. Jesus has to die for your sins and well, whatever it is that you fill in that blank with, it's an add-on. It is not as important as the fact that Jesus came, lived a sinless life, died in your place, and if you repent of your sins, you can have new life in him. That is the gospel. And Paul begins chapter three with, after making this argument, no one's ever argued with me before, no one important, no one who walked and talked with Jesus has ever said that I am wrong about this, and he's laid out his argument, and he says, even Peter, even Peter, the leader of the Lord's disciples, when he was wrong, I confronted him and stood, and, and I resisted him to his face because his conduct was not in line with what he said he believed. We are justified by faith, not by works. So chapter three, we start out, Paul has picked up a head of steam and he is charging up this mountain and he's going to go barreling down the other side of the hill. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now, he doesn't say before your eyes he was crucified. He says before your eyes, Christ was portrayed as crucified. So when they came and preached the gospel, whoever it was that preached these gospel to these Galatians, Paul himself, undoubtedly, uh, he told them everything they needed to know. Christ was crucified. He portrayed Christ crucified to them. Verse two, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Did you receive the spirit? And, and now this might be a difficult question for us to answer since we weren't there when the Galatians got saved. But we can only surmise that they received the spirit of the living God upon their pronouncement of faith, not with any circumcision. Now, what do I mean by the spirit of God? Well, at Pentecost, the faithful to Jesus, about 120 of them were gathered together and they received the Holy Spirit in a very powerful visible way. They saw themselves visions of a mighty rushing wind and a flame of fire descending on their heads. And then what the rest of the city saw was these crazy followers of Jesus at risk of their own lives coming out of the upper room, going up to the rooftops and preaching to everyone that Jesus was alive. Jesus whom you crucified. That's a tough sermon to preach, right? was God and you sinned by crucifying, but there is forgiveness available. And the miracle that the whole city saw of them preaching in everyone's own language. Fast forward to an experience that they had as Philip and others were preaching in Samaria. And these dirty, rotten, filthy, remember I'm only saying this to remind you that there were racial tensions between the Jews and the Samaritans. So from a Jewish perspective, these filthy, rotten, half-breed Samaritans and their religion is just as half-breed as their genetics. Philip and others are preaching to the Samaritans and they receive the word of Jesus and Peter goes up there, Peter who was at Pentecost, uh, goes up there to check out what's going on. Can Samaritans truly get saved? And while he is there, he sees the Holy Spirit fall on them just like he had experienced it on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit comes down, they're speaking in tongues. And then, of course, later on, Peter is summoned by Cornelius, a man who lives by the sea and is a God-fearing Gentile who wants to know more about Jesus. God has appeared to Cornelius and said, if you really want to know about me, you need to send for Simon, who's staying with Simon the Tanner, and you need to have him come and tell you about me. And so Cornelius sends for Simon Peter. Simon Peter comes and preaches to them. And while Simon Peter is there and still preaching, the Holy Spirit falls. And these Gentiles, 
pork, bacon, eating, uncircumcised, dance around the fire and sacrifice their children to false gods. These Gentiles don't need anything other. The only thing visibly happening is Peter's preaching. And during Peter's preaching, the Holy Spirit falls and hits like a bomb, just like the Samaritans, just like the day of Pentecost. And I don't know if there was a big... Now, now I have always believed that that was your three major groups, okay? Jews, Gentiles, and Samaritans who were always kind of somewhere in between. Peter was present to see the Holy Spirit fall on each of them. So I don't think there was a separate big Pentecost event for the Galatians, but they did receive the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, okay, did you receive the Holy Spirit because you got circumcised? Did it happen right after you got circumcised? Or did it happen when you believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, imagine you're a Galatian and, and, and this... You know, after we get saved, we do want to move on and learn more. But sometimes someone slides in and says, well, if you really want to be a good Christian, you need to. And then they add on one of those add-ons that we were talking about earlier. Instead, and, and, and here's Paul saying, okay, remember when you when the Spirit came to you? Someone preached, you believed, you asked God to forgive you of your sins, you received the Holy Spirit, you experienced the Holy Spirit, and now someone's come along later and telling you that circumcision is a part of that equation? All of your salvation already happened without the help of circumcision, right? Um when we do celebrate recovery. And by the way, I won't be going to forward church anymore. Well, I'll be going tomorrow night, but it's the last night tomorrow night for celebrate recovery down at forward church. Um, they're going to continue that ministry sort of instead of doing the worship service at the beginning, they are going to just do the small groups, which makes sense. It revolves around the small group. You're supposed to go in there. It's, it's like any other 12 step program where you have a band of people who help you and listen to your problems, and it's all, you know, well, I don't know if it's anonymous per se, but um, but they're going to continue the small group. I was not helping with the small group. They had capable lay leaders, men who and women. Unfortunately, there were not many women coming at the time uh, right now, and so they once they get some women for a small group, they'll be doing a small group. But anyways, um, it's kind of fizzled, and I'm going to be looking for somewhere else to learn about this recovery process from because we are all in recovery from sin. I ran into Joe the other day and he was saying, in fact, he ran into a friend of mine I haven't seen in probably 18 years. Uh, so a girl I knew in college and she was with my roommate at the time and all this kind of stuff. But anyway, she's, she's had a hard row to hoe and, uh, and she's, uh, and Joe says he used me as an example. You know, we got this preacher he uh, that helps us out sometimes. He's never had an alcohol problem. He's never had a drug problem. And he still has stuff to work through. Because I get up there when I speak and I tell him. I, I, you know, I tell him about some of my stuff I got to work through. And, uh, and I thought that was interesting, you know. But he's exactly right. I, I you know. So anyways, um, I'll be looking for uh, another group. And Joe said they might be starting one. Um, he had mentioned a few times we weren't doing everything that we could be doing down there uh, at that particular group. And that's all I'll say about that. I'm, I'm involved to learn. And folks, folks need to get past their stuff and they need to use salvation to do it, you know. Uh, I was raised that the big three sins that we talk about in Southern Baptist Church is drinking, cussing, and smoking. And maybe those are your add-ons. You know, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, never cuss again. Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, never touch a dr drop of alcohol again or a cigarette, you know. And you can quit drinking, you can quit smoking, you can quit cussing and go to hell. I firmly believe that. And I know people may react a little bit when I say that, but I just want to draw the big distinction. The big thing 
is Jesus. Everything else is small potatoes. Now, we don't want people to get drunk and we don't want uh, domestic violence that results from alcohol as so many times it does. And we don't want people to die of lung cancer or contract COPD or anything like that. We don't want all those negative effects of all those things. But let's be sure that the world hears us loud and clear. It's all about Jesus. And so many times in these recovery processes, we find that we can't quit drinking or smoking unless we put Jesus first in the first place. So anyways, um, so, oh, foolish Galatians, who is fooled you? And Paul's talking to us too. Oh, ye foolish Americans, who has bewitched you? So anyways, getting back to Paul's argument. Ah, yes. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Well, obviously, the answer is that they heard with faith. They didn't even know there was a law. Or they didn't, hadn't been trying to live up to a law of any kind. And they received the Holy Spirit by hearing with faith. Verse 3, are you so foolish? We're not going to get very far tonight, are we? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? So the idea is there that Small potatoes is trying to fix your flesh, but the big idea is to fix your spirit and, and the Holy Spirit comes and fixes your spirit. Now are you going to work on the little stuff? No, 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 no. Graduate, go beyond, work on bigger and bigger things, not go back to the piddly little things like the law and those things. You can't fix the flesh necessarily. You can resist the flesh. You can subjugate the flesh, but you do that by the power of the spirit. It's not about getting a circumcision done to your flesh. Verse four, did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now, we don't perform a lot of miracles here in this church, although I have seen a couple. But Paul is actually appealing to what they have seen go on. And I've shared with you, I read uh, Nick Ripkin's uh, book about the persecuted believers around the world, and they see God work all the time. They got, many times, they have no other choice but a miracle, right? Only God is going to swoop in and save them in so many cases, and they see that. And and Nick Ripkin, as he was... Uh, interviewing these people who had seen all these things and lived in a persecution situation, he said, my gosh, and you've seen all these miracles and you never thought it was unusual? And I think it was in Ukraine that he asked this guy that he was interviewing. And so this guy said, stand up and come with me. And he took him to a window in his house or whatever building they were in. And he pointed outside at the eastern horizon and he said, uh, every morning the sun comes up here. Have you ever thought that that was strange? And Nick goes, no, no, it happens every day. That's not strange at all. And he goes, exactly. We see it a lot. We get in trouble. We call on God and he rescues us. Sometimes he doesn't. You know, a lot of people die because they live in a persecution type situation and they die for the name of Jesus. But these people had also been rescued by God so many times. And he said, well, there you go. You wouldn't make a big deal out of the sun rising in the east. And we have gotten accustomed to seeing God work. And so in the New Testament, this was still a very much a persecution oriented type situation. And Paul asks in verse 5, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law, by the hearing of faith? Does the pastor or the other leaders in your church that God works miracles through, do they throw bacon away and then do a miracle? Do they do, they do something that has to do with the works of the law and only then you get a miracle? Or is it all by faith and is it all by the Spirit? Well, based on what we've seen elsewhere in the New Testament, apparently what was normal for them was by the power of the Spirit, broken, sinful human beings perform great miracles for God. So Paul has that appeal to say, really, is the works are the works of the law going to, 
provide this for you? Or are they going to provide that for you? You see miracles happen in your church. That doesn't happen by the works of the law. That happens by faith in the spirit. Verse six, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now there's a question mark at the end of that, which means that this past several verses that I've broken up into separate phrases, that was all one sentence. If this is true and this is true and this is true, and what about Abraham who believed in God and it was counted to him as righteousness? Abraham, as you probably already know, was not a perfect person. In fact, he he messed up in a way that would have him in quite a bit of trouble in our church. You know, you decided to have a child with your handmaiden. (laughs) But uh, anyways, it wasn't his good works that made him righteous in the eyes of God. It was his faith in God. Verse seven, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. If you want the full argument, go over to Romans in chapters four and five. Paul talks about this more. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed among with Abraham, the man of faith. Abraham was not a Jew. Uh, Jews came, I mean, Israelites came along later. Jews came along later. Abraham was not one of the people of God when God came to him and spoke to him. And it was not even that first conversation where God said, you and every male of your household must be circumcised. It was some time later. It was some time later after Ishmael was born because Ishmael had to be circumcised at that same time too. So Abraham lives by faith for quite a while before circumcision even enters the picture. Verse 10 For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. If you have broken even one small part of the law, you have broken the whole law. Verse 11. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So, we have... Abraham. We have Abraham unable to earn God's favor through his own righteousness, but he has faith in God, and that is what gets God's favor. Uh, we have we have the law for, of Moses, and if you're going to keep the law, you must keep every inch of it. Every inch of it. Now, we often think of ourselves as good people because we only break the laws that we think ought to be broken anyways, right? Loopholes, unwritten rules, unwritten loopholes, things that get us around. I do it. I will never forget. Um, I don't think of myself as a gossiper, right? I don't say bad things about people. I certainly don't say anything about people behind their back. I wouldn't say to their face. Uh, but this one gal that I did not care for very much, she was mouthy, she was loud, she was annoying. We had a whole bunch of unwritten rules about how you're supposed to act in public in the Ozarks. And I left the Ozarks and most people break them. And I try to tell myself, well, they don't even know, but I don't know. That doesn't make me feel any better. And she was one of the worst. And, uh. But we had a, we were trying to get the young people of this particular church that was doing really well together for fun things. And so we all went bowling one night. And after she left, I pretty much turned to the rest of the crowd. Good night, she's annoying, isn't she? And what did somebody there do? Go straight to her and tell her. And when it came back on me that I'd been talking bad about somebody behind their back, I don't do that kind of thing. That's not me. 
And if I said something bad about somebody, I would say it to their face for sure. But once, once we talked it over a little bit, I realized, my goodness, this gal has me dead to rights. I am, I, I always kind of thought that was one of the worst things you could do. You know, you could stab somebody and it wouldn't be this bad, you know. At least you did it to their face, right? But uh, <laughs> Jerry's like, you're learning about the Ozarks today. Uh, <laughs> uh, but she had me dead to rights. I had done exactly what I thought was bad and what I looked down on others for doing and what I was pretty sure I was not in the habit of doing. And the Jews had that kind of blind spot for the law of Moses. And Jesus pointed this out all the time, right? He says, uh, you, you know, you, you, uh, you Pharisees, you tithe on mint and cumin. And they must have had Mexican food back then if they had cumin, right? Uh, they tithe on mint and cumin, but you neglect the weightier things of the law. You guys are so careful to strain all the gnats out of the wine and don't re realize there's a camel sitting in the punch bowl. You know, y you don't. And uh, the big one was that they would, when their parents got older to an age where their grown children needed to care for them, uh, they would take what money they had that could go to help mom and dad in their old age and they would dedicate it to the temple in such a way that it was protected from having to give it to mom and dad. It was called Corbin. And uh, Jesus says, you guys want to nitpick all these little things of the law, but commandment number five is honor thy father and thy mother and you're not even doing that. And so we can have these blind spots. And the Jews, when it came to the law of Moses, had these blind spots. Oh, these filthy, rotten Gentiles, if they want to believe in the Jewish Messiah, they should follow the law like we do. And they don't. I will go so far as to say, if I understand the New Testament correctly, there is only one kosher Jew who has ever lived. And his name is Jesus. Now, if that doesn't sound like fighting words, I don't know what would. But it's the truth. And it's, 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 the, it's the hard truth that if I was a Jewish person, I wouldn't want to hear it. And as a religious person myself, I don't want to hear that I am unclean. But I am. It's like that moment when I realized I was a gossip and a naysayer or uh, not, whatever you could call it. Just an all-around awful hypocrite uh, and when I was just struck with oh my gosh that's actually what I did and I've got I mean I could try to argue my way out of it but but they have me dead to rights and and even in apologize. do what I say, then you went to her to apologize. maybe not exactly <laughs> I knew there'd just be another argument some other time so we did hang out after that though so um but anyways, uh, that was all 100 years ago. <laughs> but um, when they have the Jerusalem council, and we're going to wind this up, and I'll just have to remember that we got to verse 14. When they had Jerusalem council over whether or not, and that's, that's an event that I think is coming because Paul doesn't cite it in this letter. So I think this controversy is for Paul, it's boiling over in this letter. And then it's going to, they're going to, the apostles are going to call witnesses into Jerusalem to share their sides and hash it out. James gets up after hearing both sides and says, why would we hang a yoke on their necks that our fathers were never able to bear? It might be a hard truth to tell the Jewish believers that you guys, you guys were never able to keep the law of Moses, but it's the truth. It's the truth the way the Bible says it. Paul understands it. Paul explains it that way. He was a good, 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 good Jew, but he wasn't good enough. He was never going to be able to keep all that. The rich young ruler. Oh, Jesus, I've kept all of those things since my youth. Baloney. You didn't. Okay. No one lives up to the law of God. 
Verse 12, but the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so we might receive the promised spirit through faith. And so basically, uh, you earn a curse when you try to live up to the law and you fail. Jesus willingly takes on that curse because Jesus never broke the law of Moses and yet he was still cursed being hanged on a tree. Think about that. Jesus never earned any kind of punishment, but they, but, but it does say in the old Testament law that that horse thief that you hang in a tree or whoever, he, it's an, it's an extra amount of shame. It's an extra amount of guilt that is tacked on to him because Society thought he was nasty enough to hang him by a tree. And of course, that wasn't specifically crucifixion that they had in mind, but it's, it's very much the same thing. And so cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus took a curse. He never earned a curse. He never had any of his own sin that he would have to pay for. And yet he died a condemned man. So that, in verse 14, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. And God had foretold this. God had told Abraham, in you I will bless all the nations of the earth. Now, if God was wanting to turn the whole earth Jewish and bless the Jewish nation once he had turned the whole earth Jewish, that would, God would have said that. But that's not how he said it. He said, through you, Abraham, we're going to bless all the nations of the earth all of the nations, all of the uncircumcised nations, not just the Jews, but all the nations of the earth. And that can only be properly understood as being fulfilled in Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross that not only saves Jews, but saves Gentiles, all of those who would believe. And even doesn't save unbelieving Jews and doesn't save unbelieving Gentiles. But we must repent of our sin and turn ourselves over to Jesus. And I don't know if I don't know if I'm beating a dead horse. Um, sometimes I feel like you cannot explain salvation enough because just when I assume that our church has it, we got it, we've heard it a million times, so it's okay to move on to something else. Just when that happens, God allows somebody to say something to show me, okay, we're gonna have to go over it again. But that's good, right? We're always proclaiming the salvation of Almighty God. That way, if, an, if a slick-talking preacher or even an angel from heaven comes down and preaches any other gospel, we will know to reject that other gospel. You cannot add anything on to Jesus. If circumcision doesn't make the cut, nothing will. So, questions, comments? Were Jesus' disciples also apostles? Now, normally when we say Jesus' disciples, we usually mean the 12, right? But disciple means student. So when Jesus was preaching to 5,000 people one day, they were all his disciples. In fact, there are several times that, you know, uh, after he fed the 5,000, and uh, John makes special mention of many people were following him because they expected to be fed again. And so Jesus comes out and delivers the groundbreaking sermon of, if you really want to follow me, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And many of his disciples left that day. That's not the 12, that's the 5,000. So disciples technically means any student. Jesus always had way more than 12 disciples. His 12 were also students of his, so they were also disciples, but when he, from the moment he sent them out to cast out demons, they were his sent ones, his apostles, by the definition of the word. Then, of course, you have Jesus crucified, risen from the dead. They, they are given the Holy Spirit, and they are sent by God to proclaim this gospel to the whole world. They are definitely apostles, 
And um, we usually use the term apostle to mean the high ranking ones, the ones who gave us the gospel of God. It came through them. Does that answer your question? Well, and Paul considered himself to be an <clears throat> Right. Someone might say, you didn't actually walk and talk with Jesus. You're not on the same level of Peter, James, and John. And he would say, yes, I am. I heard from God. God sent me with this message. I am an apostle. We had two men in our church, your families, that left our church. And they went to call them to start a new church, and they called themselves apostles. Oh, yeah. Really? You'll, you'll run into this sometimes when people go especially if they go somewhere where no one knows anything about Jesus. You know, the, the apostles, the original apostles had a task to go out into a world that knew nothing about Jesus. Everything was brand new. So sometimes we will kind of use the word apostle when we go into a country that no missionary has ever been to before. Or, you know, as our country becomes more and more post-Christian, you know, you'll hear me say things like, well, buck up. This is the world. This is just like the world the apostles worked in. You know, uh, you get to be almost a new apostle. You know, Patrick went to the Irish and there were some preachers in Ireland before him, a few, but no one had the impact pastor Patrick did in Ireland. And so he's the apostle to the Irish. No one had ever been sent there before. So now were they kind of way off off the deep end, calling themselves apostles and starting a new church. Well, and... no, I mean, I, in our lesson this morning in Sunday school, we're talking about like being uh, yeah, in, uh, disciples to go out and to teach. Yeah, disciple making. Others. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, in the whole thing, it is is as we become a Christian. You know, there's some people. That went poor, and that was the last time they darkened the door. They think they're still saved. Yep. Well, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. We don't know. We can't judge that. God has to judge. So Ultimately, God judges. Yeah. But, but we are told what to do about that. Is, there's not much. I was listening to a guy preach this morning. He said, I want this guy got, got saved and never showed back up for a long time. And he said, We'd like to get you trained in that. I, I've got it all. I've got it under control and all this. You know, he thought Vince, he got saved. And so, uh, in so doing, the preacher says, well, you know, we don't see no evidence uh, if he's out doing what he should be doing. But how did he train? Who did he, who trained him? And I think we'll call that in our time mentors to new Christians. Those that are saved, uh, you know, Billy Graham. I told you, in their crusades, they they do more work on after the crusade than they do actually for the crusade, because the importance of training a new convert isn't he just gets saved and he's on his own, right? No work. Right. And right. so the reason I say that's in that because you know so many times we hear. Jesus disciples or apostles mm -hmm. and you were talking about apostle with somebody writing a book yeah and yeah or or they have authority so apostles have authority consider John that wrote the gospel of John first second and third John would be an apostle Is yeah correct but yeah generally I mean he walked and talked with Jesus so he's yeah, definitely an apostle he's, he's now, definitely but he's still he was sent by God with a message. But Paul knew, that he knew the law forwards and backwards. He knew what was right and what was wrong. And after he got saved, it got more evident how wrong it was to try to follow the law. Because he preached that money to the Gentiles. So you remember, uh, probably back in that time, uh, the Gentiles and Jews didn't have a whole lot of inter mixing except probably for maybe commerce or something. Right. But uh, uh, you know, and you talk about Samaritans where they hated Samaritans and you know and all that. But I, I try to put in my mind, you know, as when Jesus left, when he went home and he left the disciples and the apostles there to carry on the work. Yes. And as he did 
did that, of course, Peter was always a man in charge. Yeah, I don't care where he was. He was in charge. He he, he, he liked to be, you know. He was an in charge kind of guy. Yeah. And as I was listening to when, when uh, in the, as you read in the book of John, did you read the book of John this morning? Yes. Yeah. It's when they, like you say, uh, and, and on the way home, I heard a message on the same thing, and uh, uh, but. As you, as you say to John, he told about the soldiers fell back. Yeah. Well, you don't see that in Matthew or Mark or Luke where that happened. But see, it, it's a lot of that has to be in the mind of what you saw and what you try to put out there. What the others evidently didn't see that because maybe they had, you know, when Jesus told them, leave them alone. Yep. They started moving off. Yep. Arrest me. Leave these men alone. Yep. So, anyways, I, Larry. I, I just want to comment. You know, you asked the Japanese apostle. My Japanese always was an apostle person that met Jesus face to face. Yep. Uh, uh, and Paul uh, didn't meet him face to face. He met him on the, the road to Damascus. Road, guess, yeah. Paul says in Corinthians that uh, uh, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Right. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Yep. And his grace was bestowed on me, upon me. It was not in vain, for I labor more abundantly than they are. So, we'll say, so whether it was I or whether it was they, so we preach and so we believe. Yep. Uh, yep. And God. That's the, Paul's defending his apostleship. Yeah. And not to defend himself personally, but to defend his message. Yeah. Because if people aren't believing his message, there's going to be problems. You know, we're not going to have the salvation that saves. We're going to be putting our faith and trust in something else. So, anyways, um, all right, I think we're going to close her up there. Get Noella in bed, maybe. Uh, but pray with me, would you? Father, we thank you for all that you've given us. We thank you for your love and your kindness. And I just pray that your hand would be upon us, O oh Lord, as we struggle to understand your grace. And Lord, as we struggle to see all of the other things that we might have added to your salvation, all of the good, the things that might be good in and of themselves, and yet they distract us from the from your message. And so God, I pray that you would burn your message into our hearts uh, and that we would then take that to the rest of the world and help us to greatly reduce those things that stand in the way in our lives and in each other's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you all.